If you somehow missed it, we're in Australia for the 2023 World Time Attack Challenge. We've faced a handful of issues getting to where we are now, but the car has passed scrutineering and has turned a handful of laps on practice day. But that's not without both some ups and some downs. On the upside, Keichi Tsuchiya gave the 244 GTK his stamp of approval. But on the downside, we've done considerable damage to our carbon fiber front splitter, and worse, we've done extreme damage to our Quave sequential gearbox. It's jumping from second to third gear, and we don't even know if it's going to hold up. However, that's where we pick up, and it's now Friday morning. Not only is it a new day, but it's also the first day of competition at the World Time Attack Challenge. If we're faced with two options, either worrying about our transmission troubles or simply knuckling down and dealing with the problem as best we can, well, I'm going to go with the latter because I'm here to drive. It is a massive motivator to be surrounded by some of the fastest time attack cars in the world, and I'm not going to let some transmission troubles stop us yet. We arrived at Sydney Motorsport Park bright and early. Given how the last episode left off, clearly we have a handful of changes and fixes we need to make before the car goes out on track this morning. For the transmission, our best bet is to drain the fluid, clean it out, refill it, and make sure that it's at capacity. In this case, it's suggested that we run 1.95 liters. With respect to our damaged front splitter, we sent it out for some overnight carbon repairs, thanks to a local guy who was willing to tackle this project with the very limited time we gave him. But he wasn't due at the circuit until 8 a.m., just one hour before we were to head out on track. So we collected our timing equipment and got all of our ducks in a row. It was a waiting game until 8 a.m. So the situation at the moment is we don't have much of second gear. It's popping out. I was looking at in-car footage from yesterday. And basically, anytime I get into boosts, it's immediately jumping to third. I think the dogs are just probably rounded off or something. I'm worried that I'm just not gonna be able to stay in boost and the car is gonna be slow just due to the way that kind of the car is geared and the fact that I need that boost to, to really get it going. Um, try to remember that I'm here, we're still running the car. The car still seems happy otherwise. The guys have been awesome working on this thing while I've been trying to do everything else here at the track. And uh, yeah, I guess at this point, I gotta go to a driver's meeting and then we'll be out on track. And while I was at the driver's meeting, the gang was downstairs in the garage figuring out our splitter plan. The repairs for the damage that we had assessed last night are already done and it's ready to go back on the car. We had this whole thing created force. Both sides, mid stepper. Put some pucks in right there to make it thicker so it's not just pulling at core material. It'll be a lot better. But fixing the damage is only half the battle. If we were to simply bolt it back onto the car and make no further changes, then we're not really fixing the issue, just fixing the symptom. The RS Future Aero Kit that we have on the car generates an immense amount of downforce, especially at the speeds we're seeing on the front straight. Our front springs are compressing more than we anticipated due to the load, but at the same time, the splitter itself is flexing at the outside corners but some cable supports that are attached to the chassis should add enough rigidity to remedy the issue at hand. As our morning fixes came to a close, the gates for the event opened and the crowds began to form. People were excited to see the Ferrari in the flesh, and of course, I was excited to put on a show and drive this thing through whatever efforts decide to rear their head. Of the test laps we did complete yesterday, they went reasonably well. The car feels good, balanced, and safe, so I feel reasonably confident in leaning on it. My only concern at this point is with the transmission itself. But my game plan is this. The transmission seems to shift itself from second to third gear as soon as the load begins to kick in, right as boost builds up. But unfortunately, when the shift happens, I'm falling out of boost and losing most of my power. My thought is that as long as the transmission survives these shifts, the worst case scenario is that I'm down on power and it takes time to rebuild the boost from the low range of RPM up until about 6,500 RPM in third gear when the turbo has fully kicked in. I figure as long as the transmission doesn't blow itself apart, it might slow me down, but I can drive through this.
Now for better or worse, a GoPro mounted to the front of the car generates an insane amount of wind noise. So as the car gets faster, the sound of it disappears. So I'm cutting the audio back and talking about what I'm actually experiencing. In the next episode, we're gonna have a lot of on-track footage from within the car that'll be a lot better off. Through the first few turns, the transmission felt normal. Shifting felt as expected and nothing felt out of place, especially as I rounded the corner and went over the bridge, the first on-throttle section of the track on my outlap. It didn't shift itself, and I was building a bit of boost, so my confidence was rising. Maybe our fluid change had a positive effect. Turn 5 here scrubs a lot of speed, but it requires a downshift into second, and it's a hard throttle push up the hill, which again, the transmission held on for. Turn 6 brings us what feels like to a stop, and then all hell broke loose. That violent free rev was second gear completely letting go. The transmission once again attempted to shift itself, and this time it didn't hang on. The rest of the lap into the pit sounded like a bag of hammers inside the transmission, and it was abundantly clear this thing is absolutely broken. On top of that, the transmission didn't want to shift down into first or up into third, which meant even if we wanted to somehow try to drive this thing without second gear, the gearbox was effectively useless. So on the outlap of my first ever lap of competition, we were done, and I brought it back into the pit. It was hard enough to climb out of the car and tell my friends and family that we were officially dead in the water. But the second I got out, I was also met face to face with a microphone and a camera because there were a lot of other people here just to see this car perform, and I had to break the bad news. The car was effectively immobile, and its weekend was over. We didn't have a spare transmission even if we wanted to attempt to fix it. Everyone's well wishes and hopes that we could enjoy the rest of the weekend were of course meaningful, but ultimately futile. This broken gear set felt like the final nail in the coffin. Of course, despite the troubles our experience at World Time Attack so far was incredible. But with their motto of one perfect lap, I couldn't help but feel robbed that even without a perfect lap, we hadn't even gotten a complete lap in competition. And all of that to say, even if, somehow, we could find a complete replacement Quaif sequential gearbox here on the other side of the world, spirits were at rock bottom. Yeah, do we spend 10 grand and a bunch of time to do a couple laps tomorrow, or do we park it and enjoy the time and talk to everyone else that's here to see the car? And, and to that end, Byron was right. Even if we somehow could find a replacement sequential gearbox, paying for it was going to be an issue. I already spent every dollar that I have to my name just to get to Australia, and adding an $11,000 gearbox to the equation means spending money I simply do not have. And what would I get out of it anyway? The best case scenario at this point is that I turn a handful of laps tomorrow only to push myself further into debt than I already am just to pull this trip off in the first place. Two and a half years of work just to get to this point where it feels like it's all falling apart. The car is broken, we're out of money, we have no solution to fix it, and the event has just begun. Not to mention, I'm further from home than I've ever been before. A lot of people came to World Time Attack Challenge just to see the 244 GTK, and so instead of keeping it locked up in our pit garage, we knew the best move was to take it over to Haltech's booth and display it, where at least if it wasn't going to be turning laps, it could still be enjoyed by thousands of people. I like to imagine that the car didn't disappoint any fans, but it was still hard to tell each of them when they asked, when's the car going out again? When can I see it turn laps that that simply wasn't gonna happen? At this point, the car is simply a showpiece. Our weekend is done. This is officially game over. But then something happened. Our pit neighbor reminded us there was one other car at Sydney Motorsport Park running the exact same gearbox that we were. The Spoon Sports FK8 Endurance Civic. It was shipped over from the United States to run this weekend, 
But as a non-competing car only doing exhibition laps, it wasn't necessarily in need of that spare gearbox. And so Z from JDM Yard, also known as Spoon Australia, let us know that if we were in need of that gearbox, he'd be willing to sell it to us. Now, if you're wondering how a front-wheel drive Civic transmission is going to work in our mid-engine Ferrari, well, that was by design. But what was surprising is the fact that the Civic and the Ferrari are running the exact same gear set as well. That means the gearbox Z holds on his shelf as a backup for the Civic is an exact match for the one I have. So I turned my attention back to the team and began every justification I could conjure. We're here. The car's here. And now there's also a transmission here. And I've been steadily increasing my credit limit on my credit card specifically for an instance just like this. One way or another I can figure out how to pay for this thing in the future. But what I can't do is guarantee I'll be back for an opportunity like this. And so, we struck a deal. For 17,000 Australian dollars, I was now the owner of a second Quaif QK E8J sequential transmission, and we just needed to go pick it up. But there's still a lot that lies ahead of us, because changing the transmission out is no easy task. As many of you already know, replacing it requires not only pulling the engine and transmission, but it also requires pulling the intercooler, all of the charge piping, the turbo, the manifold, and the entire dry sump system. It's going to be a long night if we want to pull this off. But before we get to that, there's something slightly more pressing. All right, so right now, we're pausing from figuring out our transmission fiasco because we've just been given the invite to ride along with Suchia in the new Hyundai, and obviously I'm not gonna turn that down. Transmission be damned. Lemons, lemonade, something like that. So we gotta suit up. I'm never gonna get to do something like this again. It was one thing to have Keichi Tsuchiya admire my car, but if you had ever told me that I'd be riding shotgun with the Drift King himself as he absolutely boils the tires off of a car, I never would have believed you, not in any form. I can't imagine a world in which somebody doesn't know who Keichi Tsuchiya is, but if you've been living under a rock, this man is the godfather of drifting. Series like the D1 Grand Prix and Formula Drift owe it all to this guy, as do aspects of pop culture like Initial D and Wang and Midnight. Keichi Tsuchiya is a cultural icon, and I cannot believe I'm riding next to him as he does what he does best. He's in his element, and I am in awe. So if finding an identical transmission to the one that we actually needed wasn't enough of a sign that I should push through and do this, an experience like this reminded me that this entire weekend is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. So with that said, responsibility be damned. I am not going home without turning some laps of my own. Thank you so much. I will never forget that. But the time for being chummy is over. If we want to pull this off, we've got to get down to work because we have an entire driveline to pull. And after a bit of back and forth about whether or not to take the car to a local shop or to go for it right here, we decided this car is going to come apart trackside. There are of course a few details we still have to work out, such as 
how we're actually going to get the engine out of the car, but those can be figured out as we move forward. The fear was wasting too much time loading the car and all of our things up, finding somewhere else to work on it, and getting the car back by the morning. Now, the transmission can't come out separate because of how tight the chassis is. So we need to pull a transmission with the engine itself. And pulling the engine uh, involves pulling the inner cooler, the full exhaust, the intake plenum has to come off, dry silk tank has to come off, well, other as against first. Basically everything out of the way so that we can get the engine straight up through this small opening and out the back. So that's the move. You heard the man. The entire car from the bulkhead back has to come apart, and the only part we'll be leaving behind will be a handful of hoses and the fuel cell itself. But it's all hands on deck, and as my father always says, many hands make light the work. So the objective is to divide and conquer. My job, for the most part, is to direct. I'm the only one who knows how the car actually comes apart, so it's my job to make sure everybody knows in what order everything actually has to come out. Otherwise, we're going to waste an immense amount of time fumbling in order to get this done. That's what makes it important to recognize that this would have been flat out impossible to pull off if it hadn't been for all of the friends that came along this journey with me. So a special thanks to Byron, Oxer, John, Justin, Anthony, Wade, Brad, my dad, and of course the Haltech crew for diving in headfirst to help me pull this off. Within an hour or so of pulling the car into the pit garage, the engine bay was starting to look a bit more empty. The prospect of actually getting the engine out of the car was looming on the horizon, and thus, we were going to need a solution sooner than later on how to actually lift it up and out. A cherry picker works, but it's tough given how far the engine is actually buried in the car. And that means we were really lucky when a fellow enthusiast offered up a brand new gantry delivered to the track for us to assemble and use to get the engine out of the car. I've said it before, but if this isn't a testament to how absolutely incredible and helpful the Australian motorsports community actually is, well, I've got nothing left for you. Bottom to top, throughout this entire endeavor, the community around us at Sydney Motorsport Park was going above and beyond doing everything that they possibly could in order to help us pull this swap off. Of course, there's the transmission and the gantry, but even things down to small specialty tools, things we didn't bring along with us because, well, we never thought we'd get this far in. But here we are putting forth our best effort, all thanks to the community Ian Baker and the World Time Attack Challenge have put together. I had said prior to leaving that a transmission was the one thing I didn't want to break while we were at the track. But even despite that, and despite not really having a way to pay for it, I was somehow having fun. I wouldn't say that I wanted to pull my engine out of the car, but somehow all of this work and effort and the teamwork involved made the prospect of turning laps on Saturday morning entirely worth it. Right around the time the engine was ready to come out of the car, our new replacement Quaif gearbox had showed up, again thanks to JDM Yard. Now the only difference between this transmission and the one that we have in the car is the differential inside of it. The one in my car is a helical type while this one has a clutch type. But after a bit of discussion, we're just going to run what's in there instead of pulling it all apart. It might change a few of the dynamics of my car, but I'm not too worried about it. In fact, I might even like it. So as Corey always said, dude, it's fine. All that matters at this point is getting this engine out and getting this job finished.
So we've got the engine out finally. It wasn't too bad to do. It's never a good time, but it's out. Now it's just a matter of swapping everything from the transmission that was in the car over to the new one. We're gonna take some measurements for the throw out bearing clearance, make sure that that checks out just because it's a part and it seems like the smart thing to do. Otherwise, there's really not much else. We'll do a quick cleanup of the engine, get all the oil and stuff off of it just so we can tell if other stuff's leaking. And then we're gonna bolt it all back together. I'm going to keep my fingers crossed that this next transmission won't break. Who knows what will happen, but the best we can do is our best, so we're going to get it back together. Keep our fingers crossed. With the driveline removed from the car and the engine separated from the transmission, it begs the question, what on earth actually happened here? And to be honest, we don't really know yet. We're not gonna pull the transmission apart until we get it back stateside. But our new Aussie friend Mo has a lot of experience with these transmissions and was the first of many people to tell us there's a critical flaw within them. As I understand it, the nut that holds the primary gear stack together likes to back off under high load and high RPM, and it needs to be tack welded into place to prevent this. I would have assumed that an $11,000 transmission wouldn't have such an egregious flaw, but then again, I'm not a transmission engineer. So we'll have to add that to our to-do list. But otherwise, the new transmission is just about ready to be mounted to our motor. While Wade and I take care of that, the rest of the gang is going on a field trip. With the engine apart and out of the car, it's presented the opportunity to make one other change. The 244 GTK still has rubber engine mounts from when I thought this was originally meant to be a street car, but we've got a golden opportunity to fix that. All right, so we're down at Hypertune. Um, we spoke to one of the boys at Easter Creek. Mike needed some uh, solid engine mounts made up, made some calls. The boys said that they could make up some solid engine mounts for us on the lathe, CNC machine, whatever they're gonna do. Drove so about half an hour to come and get all these done and they're gonna work through it and get it all sorted for us. So if you've got like a big car in Australia, you get these guys to do your manifolds, intercoolers, radiators, everything. These are the guys to make them, so. Despite having four individual mounts on our K-Series motor, the rubber mounts themselves were allowing for a lot of engine movement, especially under load. When Mo mentioned that he might be able to pull some strings and have Hypertune make us some aluminum solid mounts, we figured it's now or never. It's a part, so let's go for it and give us the best chance of success tomorrow. Upon arrival, Aaron, also known as Overtime Fab, was willing to contribute a handful of his precious Friday night hours to custom machine some aluminum mounts to replace our original rubber ones. For a skilled lathe operator, these are pretty simple parts to make. It's a handful of diameters turned into a single piece of aluminum. But for guys like us who have neither the skills nor the tools to do this, this was a massive, massive help. Between the trip out to Hypertune and the time it took to machine the parts, it did mean delaying getting the engine back into the car, as, after all, we can't put it in without mounts in hand. But this seemed like a worthwhile sacrifice. So a special thanks once again to Aaron. Before we knew it, Aaron had pulled it off. In hand were custom-machined Billet 6061 T6 solid engine and transmission mounts. As you might expect, the fitment was nothing short of perfect. These are a direct replacement for what we had in the car prior, and with a bit of luck, they should bolt right into place with no need for modification to the chassis. There's a chance we might have to tinker a little bit given that we won't have any flex in order to get our bolts into place, but I'm feeling good about getting these things bolted in. While the gang was getting the engine mounts made, Wade and I took the time to measure our clutch throwout bearing clearances and then mated the transmission to the block. All we needed was for those mounts to show up, and we had to shorten a bit of hardware in order for everything to go together. But otherwise, it was a bolt-on affair, and within a few minutes of their arrival, the engine was ready to go back into the car. Dropping the engine in is admittedly a delicate act of balancing. 
the K24 has to go in at a perfect angle in order for everything to clear. The alternator likes to hit the rear glass, and the dry sump pump likes to run into the chassis. On the other end, the transmission doesn't clear much of anything, so it's a perfect approach angle in order to pull it off. The gantry did make life easier, but without a load leveler, we were at the mercy of the tools available to us, including some blocks of wood. Is everyone okay? Yeah, the wood just shattered. Yeah, that's okay. Not all of the wood survived, but thankfully all of our fingers and limbs did. And fortunately, the rest of the installation of the engine was relatively smooth sailing. The evening jaunt for custom engine mounts did consume quite a bit of time, but honestly we weren't too concerned with it. We were all willing to put in an all-nighter if we needed to. As long as we get the car done, we'd be happy. But unfortunately, the track staff had a different plan for us. They were asking us to leave. No, unfortunately, they're kicking us out in an hour, so we're just making as much progress as we can right now. All right, we'll see you in a bit. Okay. Suddenly, there was a newfound pressure to get everything finished. The track staff was unwilling to let us stay any later than midnight. While we probably could have shut the doors and hid for the evening, I wasn't willing to disrespect both the facility and the staff in that kind of way. So all we could do was knuckle down. It's in moments like these that it's easiest to get frustrated when the pressure ramps up and the tension grows. But despite the challenges that brought us to this moment and the challenges we faced in this moment, we were still having the time of our lives. There are few times when you can say there's nowhere else you'd rather be than hunched over the back of your car, tearing it apart or putting it back together. But this is unquestionably one of those moments we will all look back on and cherish forever. But as special as this moment is, it wouldn't have the impact that it does without one more challenge. In what felt like the home stretch of preparing to go home for the evening, we realized that the clutch slave cylinder line during some point of this ordeal had the threads stripped out of it. Due to the construction of the car and the way it all goes together, there's no way to replace this line without pulling the engine and transmission all the way back out of the car. And at this point, there's just not enough time left to pull that off. We'll have to figure out some sort of solution in place if we want this car to go back out on track. Without a fix, all of this work and all of the money spent on a brand new transmission are completely pointless. We discussed every possibility we could conjure, from clamping the line and running the slave cylinder backwards, to tapping the inside of the fitting and putting a new piece of hardware in place. Perhaps we could weld the end of the fitting and tap it, or anything to make this work, as long as we could get a clutch to work and get us off of the starting line. But with each idea we came up with, there were a half dozen reasons they simply wouldn't work. With track staff knocking on the door telling us it was time to go home, we were forced to try to brainstorm this from afar. My greatest fear was having just bought a transmission I can't afford and having it all be for naught. The best we can do at this point is to make light of the situation and hope for the best tomorrow. Yeah, you're gonna wake up and you're gonna have some fucking crazy idea. That's very confident of you. <laughs> <laughs>